All right, welcome everybody to the second chapter of General Chemistry 2, Chapter 16, which is Chemical Equilibrium. And this is going to be a two-part lecture sequence um, similar to the first uh, chapter that we covered. And one of the things I really like to discuss with students right out the gate when we start General Chemistry is that this is really the first semester of your chemistry experience where we start to add shades of gray to all of the absolutes we were teaching in Gen Chem 1. So in Gen Chem 1, we did a lot of, does something precipitate or not? Does it dissolve or not? Does a reaction proceed or not? What we're going to spend most of our time doing for the rest of the semester is discussing how much does something dissolve? How much does something precipitate? To what extent does a reaction proceed in the forward direction and in the reverse direction, and how can we manipulate that to our advantage um, in controlled conditions. So what we're going to start doing with equilibrium is discussing the nature of reactions and how they proceed forward, how they proceed in reverse of how they're written, and how those two events reach equilibrium and how we can predict uh, use these models of equilibrium to make chemical predictions. That said, moving right into it. So right out the gate, let's talk about hemoglobin a little bit. It's a nice biological example, but it's also something most of you have been exposed to um, in a previous class at some point and have a general feel for since it's our Make main transport mechanism for oxygen in our blood. And it also happens to be a really good example of dynamic equilibrium and how equilibrium can change based on all of the components that are participating in a reaction. So hemoglobin, which is subtitled, subtitled HB, is found in our red blood cells and it binds oxygen gas. And the it, when it binds oxygen gas, um, we can look at this reaction and say hemoglobin as a reactant binds oxygen gas as a reactant and when hemoglobin is bound to oxygen that is our product. And you'll notice right away that we're using this double-sided arrow to describe something which we call dynamic equilibrium. And the double-sided arrow, whereas we've typically seen reactions progress with a forward arrow. Oh, that's a terrible arrow. Let me, let me try that again. Drawing on tablets is not my forte, but we're going to give it a try. This double-sided forward, this double-ended forward arrow is what we've been seeing with a reaction proceeds type arrow. But what we're going to see almost exclusively for this semester is this double-sided arrow, where we have a forward reaction, with the arrow pointed over to our right, and then we have the reverse reaction with the arrow pointed towards our left. And the reason this is important is because not only does hemoglobin and oxygen bind to form the product oxygenated hemoglobin, but oxygenated hemoglobin can dissociate in the reverse direction, releasing oxygen and liberating non-oxygenated hemoglobin. So what we're really looking at is a dynamic forward and reverse reaction which our biology utilizes to its advantage. So let's talk about that a little bit. So the concentrations of our hemoglobin, oxygen, and oxyhemoglobin are all inter interdependent. Um, and the ratios of all of these depend on how much is available of the others. So the way we describe this um, mod in terms of modeling is with the equilibrium constant, which is K. So this term K is our equilibrium constant. And generally, some rules that we want to get comfortable with right out the gate. If you have a large value for K, that means that the products at equilibrium are in fairly high concentrations. And if you have low values for K, that means your products are going to be in low concentrations at equilibrium. 
equilibrium. And we're going to spend a lot of time reinforcing this concept, but just to kind of get the discussion started, that's where we're at. And what's really important to know is that if you change the concentration of any of our reactants or products in an equilibrium reaction, that's going to necessitate a change to the concentrations of the other components to return everything to equilibrium, so to that constant K. So a good example of this would be oxygen transport with hemoglobin. So in the lungs, where we have very high concentrations of oxygen available, what happens is, is in our reaction that we're looking at down here at the bottom, we are adding oxygen to our equilibrium system. And what this does is to make everything return to equilibrium, drives the reaction towards oxyhemoglobin. However, once that oxyhemoglobin reaches areas of low oxygen concentration, such as in the muscles, we are the muscles are consuming this oxygen, we don't have enough of it around, so these levels are decreasing or being removed from the system. And as this is being removed from the system, to return to equilibrium, our reaction gets pulled over towards the reactant side. And this is happening through an active dissociation of the oxyhemoglobin back to our standard hemoglobin and free oxygen. And this is how oxyhemoglobin liberates oxygen into tissues that need it. Another fun uh, variation on this theme is the fact that we have different types of hemoglobin. So fetal he hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than adult hemoglobin. And this is super important because we want the fetus in a developing uh, uh, environment to have preference for oxygen. So how that works is fetal hemoglobin's equilibrium constant is larger than the adult hemoglobin, and this makes it more efficient at binding oxygen and pushing the reaction towards oxyhemoglobin. And then um, this also facilitates the transfer of oxygen from the mother's hemoglobin to the fetal hemoglobin. Nice little survival mechanism. Likewise, we also see, and this isn't in the book, variations in hemoglobin and myoglobin uh, in aquatic mammals that need to be underwater for long periods of time. And, uh, and you also see changes to the hemoglobin and myoglobin structures in reptiles that are underwater for long periods of time. Uh, that have they change their K values, the equilibrium constants, so that their hemoglobin myoglobin is perfectly tuned to the environment in which they need to be competitive. So moving along from the hemoglobin, we can start to really dive into what equilibrium is. So when a reaction starts, reactants are consumed and products are formed, right? So in any general reaction, we're going to have A equivalence of A plus B equivalence of B. In a reversible reaction form, C equivalence of C plus D equivalence of D. Let me see if I can get those pluses to look more like plus signs. Apologies for terrible plus signs. So on this side, we have our reactants. At the initiation of a reaction, there is no reverse reaction because we have no products yet. So that's what we're really starting with here. Reactants start to come together, and the reaction single-sidedly moves towards our products. Now, as our concentration of our reactants decrease, the rate of that forward reaction also decreases because rate of reaction is dependent on concentration. So as we're consuming our reactants, the speed with which we consume them decreases. Likewise, as we form products, the products start to have the ability to do the reverse reaction. And the reverse reaction is this dissociation of the products back to our reactants. And as we build up the concentration of products, the rate of the reverse reaction will increase because we're increasing the concentration of the products. So what you end up with is at some point, the process is proceed at the same rate. When the forward reaction rate of reaction 
and the reverse reaction rate of reaction equal one another. When the reaction is happening at this speed, at the same reaction, this way, you reach what is called equilibrium. Right? So that's what we're going to be studying. And that's the general concept. But what's really important to remember is that the relative forward rate of reaction and relative reverse rate of reaction are what are going to determine the relative quantities of product and reactant. So dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium is the condition wherein the rates of forward and reverse reactions are equal. Basically just a nice way to restate what we just said. When the rates of forward and reverse reaction equal each other, things are in dynamic equilibrium. And it's important to remember that it's dynamic because we continuously have reaction taking place. It's just that the concentrations aren't changing because the rate of forward and rate of reverse reaction are the same. Doesn't mean that chemically everything is static, just the concentrations. And doesn't mean we can't change the concentrations by modifying the system or reaction conditions to shift the equilibrium conditions. So once the reaction reaches this equilibrium, the concentrations of all of our chemicals remain constant. Um, and that's what is our constant, but everything else is still chemically in motion. So a good example of this um, process pictorially, we have the reaction of hydrogen gas and iodine gas reversibly forming two equivalents of hydrogen iodine or hydroiodic acid gas. So at time zero, the initiation of this reaction, we put the hydrogen iodine together and they have had no opportunity to react with one another. So in this particular case, arbitrarily, we've set the reaction concentrations of both hydrogen and iodine gas to eight moles per liter. And the concentration of the product is zero. Moving forward, in 16 seconds into the reaction, we've reduced our concentration of hydrogen and iodine from eight to six apiece, and we've formed four moles, um, or excuse me, a concentration of four moles per liter hydrogen iodide gas. At this point, though, hydrogen iodide gas is also proceeding in the reverse direction, and this is going to slow the reaction of hydrogen and iodine. And at 32 seconds, we have a even further reduced concentration of hydrogen and iodine, now at 4 moles per liter apiece, instead of where we started at 8. And the concentration of the hydrogen iodine is now at 8 moles per liter. And if we sit around a little bit longer, we realize that the concentration hasn't changed at all from the previous set of conditions. And this is because the forward rate of reaction and the reverse rate of reaction are the same, meaning the speed at which at those concentrations we saw at 32 seconds in the previous slide, at those concentrations, the forward rate of reaction of the hydrogen and iodine to form two equivalents of hydrogen iodide is identical to the reverse reaction of the dissociation of two equivalents of hydrogen iodide to one equivalent of hydrogen gas and one equivalent of iodine gas. And now we have a dynamic equilibrium system. And this is just a nice pictorial way to look at what we just said. Um, and it's just nice graphical representation of it. So what we can look at here initially is we have our concentration of iodine gas, our concentration of hydrogen gas um, in red and blue respectively, and then with the purple line we have our product hydrogen iodide. And right out the gate you can see as the reaction starts both the hydrogen and iodine gases rate of reaction decrease as their concentrations decrease, and then the rate of reaction or the concentration of hydrogen iodide increases here as a reaction proceeds. And as these slow, the rate of reaction slows and flatten out, we reach equilibrium where everything following this time of reaching equilibrium, the concentrations are maintained for all of our reactants and products.
So one thing that's really important to remember is equilibrium does not mean equal. It doesn't mean that there's any equality in the concentrations of our reactants or our products. It means that there's a balance in the rate of reaction forward and the rate of reaction in reverse. But the concentrations themselves can be very, very different because some reactions are highly favorable where the products are highly favored. Some reactions, the products are not favored. The reactants are favored and only a small amount of product is formed. So it's not equal. It's just in equilibrium. So for these different scenarios I just talked about, some reactions were going to equal uh, reach equilibrium um, after nearly all of the reactants are consumed. And in that particular case, we say that equilibrium phase favors products. Um, and the other scenario that we talked about, the reaction uh, can reach equi equilibrium when just a very small percent of reactant molecules are consumed. And under those scenarios, we say that equilibrium favors reactants. So how do we numerically assess equilibrium and the equilibrium constant? So for this general reaction, um, I poorly wrote out um, on one of the earlier slides, we have this general expression for generic reaction where A units of A plus B units of B, with both A and B being our reactants, are in equilibrium with C units of C plus D units of D with C and D, being our products. And the lowercase letters of A, B, C, and D are all our molar coefficients of our reaction in our balanced equation, and our identities of our components are our capitals. Now when we set up the law of mass action, which we see in this equation on the bottom, which is the relationship of products over reactants, we always put products over reactants, always. So whenever we're thinking equilibrium, it's always, always, always products over reactants. Say it out loud to yourself when you're doing your homework. Products over reactants. That's the relationship that matters when we're discussing equilibrium, always. Now, it's always as drawn. So because we've drawn it with A and B on the reactant side, that's our reactant side. And because C and D are on the right side, that's our products. Later we'll find we can just flip these around. C and D can be on the reactant side and A and B can be on the product side. And that changes the equilibrium constant, obviously. So it's always as the reaction is written, with products being the components on the right side, and the reactants being on the left side of the reaction as written. Um, and if we look at our law of mass action down here, we see that if you take the concentration of C raised to its molar coefficient times the concentration of D raised to its molar coefficient and divide that by the concentration of A raised to its molar coefficient and B raised to its coefficient, that gives us our equilibrium constant k, which is unitless because all the units from our concentrations cancel one another in this particular scenario. Now what I want to hammer over and over and over throughout this chapter, not only products over reactants, but what k is an expression of because of this relationship is functionally it's a ratio of our products to our reactants. It's telling us how much products are favored over our reactants or how favored our reactants are over our products based on the magnitude of its value. So let's draw a couple of these um, and just kind of get comfortable with the expression. So for this reaction where we have um, dinitrogen pentoxide, two equivalents of it are in equilibrium with four equivalents of nitrogen dioxide plus one equivalent of oxygen gas. To do this equilibrium expression, we would first go right to our products, which are over here. And I would say the concentration of nitrogen dioxide raised to its molar coefficient 4 times the concentration of oxygen raised to its molar coefficient of 1, which 
falls off the equation because it's implied, divided by the concentration of the reactant, dinitrogen pentoxide, raised to its molar coefficient 2, is going to give us our equilibrium constant, K. So as a conceptual check-in, let's go ahead and run this really fast. I think you guys will all be pretty proficient at it. Let's say we have the generic reaction, two equivalents of reactant A plus one equivalent of reactant B are equilibri in equilibrium with three equivalents of product C. What would be a, a correct equilibrium expression to find K in this particular scenario? Well, let's work it. I'm going to say K is equal to the concentration of product C raised to the third power, because that's its molar coefficient, divided by reactant A, its concentration squared, times reactant B's concentration. So it should be, should be D. And that's the correct answer. So what does K mean? Well, I've already kind of said what K is fundamentally. Fundamentally, K is just a ratio of products to reaction, reactants at equilibrium. Which means if K is substantially greater than 1, that means that the amount of reactant, or excuse me, products is substantially more, right? Because if you have, I say reactants over products terms, if you have a large value over 1, that means reactants is going to be favored over products. And often if products is in a small decimal state, that's going to make K even larger because you're dividing by something with a decimal. So when K is much larger than 1, that means that when the reaction equal, uh, reaches equilibrium, there's going to be much, much more. I'm sorry. I drew this completely backwards because of products are always over reactants. Excellent. The products are going to be highly, highly, highly favored opposite of that scenario. If k is very small, is much less than 1, that means that the reactants are going to be highly favored. Going back to one of our earlier slides, the other way we could say this. If products are favored, that means the reaction is favorable. If reactants are highly favored, because k is very small, that means the reaction is unfavorable. The reaction does not proceed towards products as written. It predominantly stays as reactants. So a couple pictorial, pictorial examples of this. If we have a very large equilibrium constant, say the example here where you have hydrogen gas reacting with bromine gas, forming hydrobromic acid for uh, two equivalents of hydrobromic acid. Um, in equilibrium, most of this is going to proceed towards products because the rate of reaction forward is substantially higher than the rate of reaction reverse. Another way to think of this is that it is much more favorable for the reactants hydrogen bromine to form hydrobromic acid than for hydrobromic acid to decompose in the opposite fashion, forming hydrogen and bromine. So because of this, we'll have much more hydrobromic acid, which you can see in this example with the pictures. And that's going to make for a much larger term on top, a very small term on the bottom, and that will give us a very large value for K. Opposite of this, if you put nitrogen gas and oxygen gas together, in a reversible reaction to form two equivalents of nitrogen monoxide gas. This would have a very small value because the forward reaction as drawn is not very favorable. Nitrogen and oxygen don't particularly like to form nitrogen monoxide. However, nitrogen monoxide is perfectly fine decomposing to form the more stable nitrogen and oxygen gases. So because of this, reactants are favored in this particular circumstance and set of reactions. And because of that, we're going to have a fairly small value for our product and a fairly large value 
for our reactants, and that's going to lead to a small k. So whenever you have a small k, that means, remember, that products are not favored, reactants are favored. All right, so let's do another conceptual connection problem here. So for the equilibrium constant, uh, see, the equilibri equilibrium constant for the reaction, A is in equilibrium with B, is 10. So K equals 10. A reaction mixture initially contains 1.1 moles per liter of A and no B. And this makes sense because if you just have A going towards B under initial reaction conditions, you won't have any B forming. Um, but at equilibrium, which of these could be true if K is 10? The reaction mixture contains A at 1 mole per liter and B at 0.1 mole per liter, or B, the reaction mixture contains A at 0.1 moles per liter and B at 1 mole per liter, or C, the reaction concentrations are equal. So we know right away the reaction concentrations are not equal because K equals 10, which means we have a 10 to 1 ratio. So K equals the concentration of B over the concentration of A because products over reactants. And if this is 10, that means you have a 10 to 1 ratio of B to A in terms of molar ratio at equilibrium. So right away, we know the number of moles can't change. So we have to, if we start with 1.1 moles, and it's a 10 to 1 ratio, one is going to have one molar, and one's going to have 0.1 molar concentration. But which one's which? Well, we've already drawn it out. B, in this particular case, should have 10 times the concentration of A. So the scenario of B being one molar and A being 0.1 molar would be correct. The answer should be B, and in this case, it is. So let's talk through the relationships of the re, uh, between K and chemical equations. So when the reaction is written backwards, because I keep referring to as written, the equilibrium constant is just inverted. So uh, there's some short, these are basically, we're gonna go through a series of shortcuts, um, basic concepts on how K is manipulated when you change um, the way you're looking at your reaction. So if we have our generic reaction, A units of A plus B units of B for our reactants are in equilibrium with C units of C plus D units of D for our products, we would write the equilibrium expression for the forward reaction as drawn here. So our equilibrium constant K would be the concentration of C to C power times the concentration of D to D power over the concentration of A to A power times the concentration of B to B power, or just products over reactants. Now, if we were to look at it the opposite direction, going from products to reactants, we would redraw this here with C plus D going to equilibrium with A plus B. This is just the same reaction being viewed from the opposite direction. And because of that, we would write K under the way it's drawn here with A and B as our product because it is on the product side and C and D being on the reactant side. Now, the nice thing about this relationship is that these are just the inverse of one another. So if you're looking for the reverse of K from the forward reaction, so let's say the K for the forward reaction is some arbitrary number. If you're interested in what the K is for the reverse reaction as drawn, it's just going to be 1 over K. So K backwards is just 1 over K forwards. Um, you can just take the invert of K if you're interested in what K is for the reverse of the reaction as drawn. Pretty straightforward. And it's going to save you a lot of time. Another relationship that's important. When the coefficients of an equation are multiplied by a factor, the equilibrium constant is raised to that factor. 
pretty straightforward. So for the reaction, A plus B is in equilibrium with C. We can draw an original expression, in this case K original, where the product C raised to C power over A to A power times B to B power gives us our original K. Now, if we raise everything to the uh, C times two, where we have two additional molar equivalents for two times the molar equivalents for all of these things, where A and B and C all have twice the molar concentrations, we could just sub in those extra values too for all of these components. And what we'll find is that the original term will equal the new term raised to the square. Pretty straightforward. So let's do a quick check-in with these. The reaction of reactant A being in equilibrium with two equivalents of product B has an equilibrium constant k equals 0 0.010. What is the equilibrium constant for the reaction? B is in equilibrium with half of an equivalent of A. Well, what's really slick about this one is that we can immediately just do the reverse. Let's say here, um, A is in equilibrium with 2B is functionally the same as 1 half of A is in equilibrium with B because we're just dividing both sides by 2. And if we were to draw this in reverse, it would be B is in equilibrium with 1 half of A. So that's what we, we have really reached here. We've done two different transformations. Now, what's slick about this is what is K as for drawn forward? It's 0.010. What's the invert of that? It's 10. The answer should be 10. And it is. Nice. OK, so adding a layer of complexity to this. We can determine equilibrium constant expressions from concentrations, which is what we've been doing. We can also, for gases, use partial pressures of the gas. So the concentration of a gas in a mixture is proportional to its partial pressure. Once again, it's proportional to partial pressure. Therefore, it's OK to make equilibrium expressions for K sub P right here as a ratio of partial pressures of all of the gases raised to the respective uh, molar equivalents as their exponent. Now, this doesn't mean that the concentration determined value for K is going to be the same as the partial pressure constant, um, determination of K, but they're both valuable ways to look at equilibrium. Sometimes they're the same, and the book gets into that a little bit, but just don't take for granted that they're going to be identical. However, they're both valuable ways to um, look at equilibrium in gaseous systems. So let's look a little bit more at K sub C and K sub P. So in calculating the uh, equilibrium expression from partial pressures, the partial pressure values are always in atmospheres. That's all very important. The value of the K from K sub P and K sub C are not necessarily the same because they do have differences in units. Now, this relationship here is going to give you the um, exact interconversion between the two. So if you're asked to interconvert between the two and you have the temperature reaction, the number of moles that are changing, and the ideal gas law a constant, which we do, um, you can determine this. Now, what's really important to note is that if change in n is 0, that's the situation in which k sub p and k sub c are equivalent. Ooh, heterogeneous equilibria. So 
this is one of the things that you have to go through when you're determining what matters and what doesn't matter as part of determining equilibrium concentrations. So we exclude concentrations of pure solids and pure liquids from our equilibrium discussions because their concentrations don't change over the course of reaction. What's the concentration of water in water? Does changing the amount of water change that concentration? No, it doesn't. Same thing for solids. If you have a pure solid, let's say a pile of carbon, what's the concentration of that pile of carbon? You can change its amount, but you don't fundamentally change its concentration because it's a pure solid. So because of this, we can't look at changes of concentration as part of our equilibrium discussion. So a good example of this, let's look at our third bullet here. We have carbon dioxide gas reacting with liquid water is in equilibrium to form free protons. Um, and so one of the things, for those of you who haven't had me before, I refer to H plus as a proton, typically, because that's literally what it is. Because hydrogen, remember, has a proton and an electron, but no neutron. So if the hydrogen loses its electron, it is literally a proton. So I will frequently refer to uh, these H plus as a proton when I'm just discussing things. So if I say proton and you see H plus, that's what's going on. Anyway, coming back to this, we have carbon dioxide gas reacting with liquid water in equilibrium with aqueous protons and HCO3 minus also in aqueous phase. If we were to develop an equilibrium expression for this based on concentrations, we would include the reactant CO2. We would include the concentration of the product of protons and the concentration of our HCO3 minus. But we are excluding anything to do with the concentration of the liquid water. So our equilibrium expression will look like this where we have our reconcentration of reactants raised to the respective uh, molar equivalents, which are both one in this case, divided by the concentration of our product, uh, reactant CO2 gas. This is a really nice little experiment kind of proving the point of what we just said, because I know it's a bit of a head scratcher to say, well, if you have more something, how does that change the reaction? Well, let's take a look at uh, equilibrium concentrations for reaction of carbon monoxide gas, which is our reactant here, in equilibrium with the products CO2 gas and solid carbon. So changing the amount of solid carbon we have, in this case we have a little pile of solid carbon, and here we have a much larger pile of solid carbon, but changing the amount of this solid carbon has no influence on the equilibrium concentration of the gases. If we have double or triple the amount of carbon, nothing shifts the equilibrium of the reactant gases or the product gases. This means it literally does not participate in the equilibrium determination of reactants and products. So we just exclude it. Kind of a nice little proof of concept. So how do we calculate equilibrium constants from measured equilibrium concentrations. And this is where we're going to start adding some complexity because we, we, everyone at this point is probably nodding their head and it's like, okay, I got this. Okay, I got this. The real trick, which we're going to spend most of the second lecture on, is how do we use these relationships to predict things, right? Because that's what chemistry is all about, using these chemical models to accurately predict things in nature. So the most direct way of finding the equilibrium constant, experimentally, is to measure the amount of a reactant and products in a mixture at equilibrium, right? That's the most direct way to do it. And then you can plug those right into our equilibrium expression to determine K. Now it's important to note, the equilibrium mixture might have different amounts of reactants and products between different equi equilibrium mixtures. 
but the value of the equilibrium constant k is always going to be the same as long as the temperature is held constant because you shift equilibrium with temperature and we'll get more into that detail later but equilibrium constants are specific to the temperature of a reaction another way to say this is that k is independent of the initial amounts of reactants and products so if you set up a reaction, K is going to be K for that reaction, regardless of how much reactant and product you have, if you let it reach equilibrium. A good example of this. All these reactions are done at the same temperature, 445 degrees Celsius. And it's that uh, reaction we were looking at earlier, where we have one equivalent of hydrogen gas plus one equivalent of iodine gas makes two equivalents of hydrogen iodine gas and that gives us the equilibrium expression we see over here in the top right corner of the chart and you can look for this array of different reaction conditions we have reaction condition one two three four five we have five different sets of reaction conditions we have different initial concentrations of hydrogen and iodine or in the second condition, it's all hydrogen iodide gas, all product initially, or we can set up with equal concentrations of each. None of this matters because if we let them reach equilibrium and we measure their values at equilibrium, it doesn't matter where we started, it matters where we ended. And when we plug those values in, we get the same value for K, 50 across the board. So this is going to be the end of lecture one, and we're going to pick up lecture two. Um, it's just going to be a click away for you guys. So join me for the rest of the chapter. Um, if you you know take a break, stretch, maybe take a day, digest the content, and then come back and pick up part two here, chapter sixteen.